Good morning. Here we are to bring you the scriptures and thoughts and ideas of the Daily Post on this 22nd day of September. We begin with the uh, scripture from Psalm 37 and verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. To move on through the Bible in a year, we read today Ecclesiastes chapters 10, 11 and 12, and we move into the letter to the Galatians and read chapter 1. The thoughts of the day? Whatever limits us, we tend to call fate. Don't go around saying that the world owes you a living. The world owes you nothing. It was here first. Everyone complains of his memory, no one of his judgment. A very short and uh, significant motivational thought for the day. Be a fountain, not a drain. On this day, in 1735, on this day in Britain, Sir Robert Walpole became the first Prime Minister to move into No. 10 Downing Street in London. This has since become the official home of the British Prime Minister. In 1862, on this day, Abraham Lincoln made his Emancipation Declaration, abolishing slavery, and he ordered the freeing of all slaves from the 1st of January 1863. In 1872, Joseph Smith, the son of a poor New England farmer, says he received golden plates from an angel on this day. From this he translated the Book of Mormon, which led to the foundation of the religious group, the Mormons. No proof was ever offered of the uh, plates or of the angel. In 1913, on this day, a coal mine explosion killed 263 people at Dawson, New Mexico. 1968, a ceremony was held to mark the relocation of the ancient Egyptian Abu Simbel temples, honouring Ramesses II, after they were rebuilt 200 metres inland and away from the Aswan High Dam. In 1985, President, sorry, French Prime Minister Laurent Fabius appears on TV to confess, quote, agents of the DGRC sank this boat, the Rainbow Warrior. They acted on orders, close quote. In 1989, an IRA bomb attack killed 10 soldiers at the Royal Marine School of Music at Deal in Kent. Twelve other bandsmen were injured. On 1914, on oh, sorry, in 2014, on this day, NASA's Maxon space probe successfully arrived in orbit around Mars. And in 2015, on this day, Volkswagen admitted that 11 million cars have been wrongly programmed to appear to emit lesser emissions than they actually were emitting. Cost Volkswagen quite a lot of money, I think. Personal story of the day, a memory of life. It's a very touching story, this one. Twenty years ago, a friend drove a taxi for a living. When he arrived at 2.30am, the building was dark except for a single light in a ground floor window. Under these circumstances, many drivers would just toot once or twice, wait a minute, and then drive away. But he'd seen too many impoverished people who depended on taxis as their only means of transportation. Unless a situation smelled of danger, he always went to the door. This passenger might be someone who needs my assistance, he reasoned to himself. So he walked to the door and knocked. Just a minute, answered a frail, elderly voice. He could hear something being dragged across the floor. After a long pause, the door opened and a small woman in her 80s stood before him. She was wearing a print dress and a fashion hat with a veil pinned on it like somebody out of a 1940s movie. 
By her side was a small nylon suitcase. The apartment looked as if no one had lived in it for years. All the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the walls and no knick-knacks or utensils on the counters. In the corner was a cardboard box filled with photos and glassware. Would you carry my bag out to the car, she asked. He took the suitcase to the taxi, then returned to assist the woman. She took his arm and they walked slowly towards the car. She kept thanking him for his kindness. It's nothing, he told her. I just try to treat my passengers the way I would want my mother treated. Oh, you're such a good boy, she said. When they got in the taxi, she gave him an address and then asked, Could you drive through the city? It's not the shortest way, he answered quickly. Oh, I don't mind, she said. I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to a hospice. He looked in the rearview mirror and her eyes were glistening. I don't have any family left, she continued, and the doctor says, I don't have very long. He quietly reached over and shut off the meter. What route would you like me to take, he asked, and for the next two hours they drove through the city. She showed him the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. They drove through the suburbs when she, where she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds and she had him pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had once been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a girl. Sometimes she'd ask him to slow down in front of a particular building or a corner and would sit staring into the darkness, saying nothing. As the first hint of sun was lighting the horizon, she suddenly said, I'm tired, let's go now. They drove in silence to the address she had given him. It was a low building like a small convalescent home with a driveway that passed under a portico. Two orderlies came out to the taxi as soon as they pulled up. They were careful and intent, watching her every move. They must have been expecting her. He opened the boot and took the small suitcase to the door. The woman was already seated in a wheelchair. How much do I owe you, she asked, reaching into her purse. Nothing, he said. You have to make a living, she said. There are other passengers, he responded. Almost without thinking, he bent and gave her a hug. She held on tightly. You gave an old woman a moment of joy, she said. Thank you. He squeezed her hand, then walked into the dim morning light. Behind him a door shut. It was the sound of the closing of a life. He didn't pick up any more passengers that shift. He drove aimlessly, lost in thought. For the rest of the day he could hardly talk. What if that woman had got an angry driver, or someone who was impatient to end his shift? What if he'd refused to take the job, or had tooted once then driven away? On a quick review, he didn't think that he had done anything more important in his life. We're conditioned to think that our lives revolve around great moments. But great moments often catch us unaware, beautifully wrapped in what others may consider a small one. There is nothing more precious than a human life, and even more so when it's spirit-filled. The devotional thoughts of the day, the first, in its right place. The scripture is from Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9, references from the Song of Solomon Chapter 5 and verse 1. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest. The church has always valued moral purity. However, there are some confusing questions relating to acceptable behaviour between a husband and a wife. Intimacy in particular, even within the confines of marriage, has been an uncomfortable subject. As early as the second century, some Christian leaders reacted against growing worldliness in the church by urging believers to practice extreme forms of morality. They even urged married believers to abstain from sex altogether, 
or at least not to enjoy it too much. This point of view was reflected in the Desert Fathers of the second century who chose to live a solitary and ascetic lifestyle. They told the married believers who came to them for spiritual counsel to live like celibate monks. Augustine taught that sexual intercourse, even in marriage, should not be enjoyed for its own sake. He believed that it was only for the propagation of mankind. This stands in sharp contrast with today's sex-obsessed culture. Many people spend more time over a meal than they do meeting a stranger and becoming intimate. Both views, the aversion of some of the early church to sex within the confines of marriage, and modern society's casual approach to sex, are equally unhealthy and unbiblical. The Song of Solomon does not portray sexual pleasures in marriage as a necessary evil that must be suppressed or endured. Instead, the bride and groom are encouraged to enjoy themselves until they are satisfied. See verse 1. Procreation is certainly one of the obvious purposes of sex within marriage, while fertility is active. The first command to the human race recorded in Scripture was the command to be fruitful and multiply, as we read in First Genesis chapter twenty oh, sorry, as in Genesis chapter one and verse twenty two. But as we see in the Song of Solomon, enjoying sex in marriage is also important. Every day we, f- we face a constant barrage of sexual images from immodestly clothed people, television programs, magazines, and the internet. Passion, however, is not the problem. Society's problem is not that it enjoys sex too much. The problem is that our culture has removed the boundaries that God set in place for sexual expression. His rules are not intended to spoil our joy, but to protect us from the consequences of unbridled passion. Those who choose to satisfy their urges by having sex outside the confines of marriage relationship are destined to disappointment, emptiness and unintended consequences. And how important are those words in today's community? The uh, temptation, the opportunity, the inducement is everywhere. We must cling to the words of the Bible. The second thought, how committed are you? And the scripture from Psalm 37 and verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. When we make a commitment to someone, we're expected to follow through. How many times have you found yourself having to break a commitment to someone, either because of a problem, something coming up unexpected, or you just didn't feel like fulfilling it? Are you honest when you make a commitment? Do you look down the road? far enough to see if it's feasible to make the commitment in the first place. Did you count the cost, as is suggested in Luke 14 and verse 28 beforehand? Did you stop to think that you might not be able to stay committed to this person or this action? When we commit ourselves to God, we should count the cost. One of the costs is found in giving up the sins and lusts that humans have. Within ourselves, it's hard to not commit sin or have lusts of the eyes or flesh. But the power that is within us can keep our sins to a minimum. The Holy Spirit can help us have victory over the smallest or largest sin that might come our way. The Holy Spirit can help us to surpass the obstacles that get in our way of our commitment to a life with God. The enemy may come at us but ask the Holy Spirit to keep you from all evil and to sustain you every day. Praise the Lord and amen to that. The facts of the day. Dogs can hear sounds that you can't. The average person laughs 13 times a day. And the closing thought for the day. Lord, what can I do to grow and be more useful? Thank you for being with us today. We hope that the uh, thoughts and the ideas in the scriptures will be helpful and uh, thought-provoking, if not totally uplifting. 
uh, and we hope that you'll come back to us and join us again tomorrow. In the meantime, may the Lord bless your day, and bye for now.